Hello, everybody. Sorry about that. Um, if you're joining us uh, after the live airing of this, we were originally on um, a different live stream, but YouTube decided that um, that it didn't want to broadcast. So we're doing this in Google Hangouts, uh, which is fun and exciting. And we had a little bit of a scramble to get everything going, but we're here. Hello, I am Megan. For those who don't know me, welcome to Digital Hammurabi. And today I have with me Dr. Moody Al-Rashid, who is a seriological postdoc at Oxford University. Say hello, Moody. Hello. Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, today we are going to talk about um, miscarriage and kind of gynecology in ancient Mesopotamia. Um, but first, I'm going to ask Moody if she wouldn't just give a brief introduction and tell you all a little bit about herself. We've had her on before, but um, I'm assuming that several people watching this have not watched that particular live stream. So, Hi, everyone. Uh, as Megan said, I'm Dr. Moody Al-Rashid. I'm a postdoc at Wolfson College in Oxford. Um, I specialize in medicine and science in ancient Mesopotamia, mostly first millennium uh, BC, obviously, in text. Um, but I also look more specifically at mental health and illness in, uh, in ancient Mesopotamia. So this isn't quite my specialty, but it is something I've had the opportunity to teach in the last couple of months. And I'm looking forward to sharing some perspectives from the ancient world on women's, women's health. Lovely, thank you very much. Um, I just got a new chair from my beautiful assistant, Dr. Josh, because I was very, very short. And now I am giant Megan. Um, <laughs> <laughs> which is always fun. Um, so before we get started, I wanted to give a little bit of background about why um, we decided to do this stream. Um, it's kind of personal, so uh, we're getting real, which is always exciting. Um, miscarriage isn't really talked about enough in modern society, in my personal opinion, um, which makes it incredibly difficult for women who are going through a miscarriage to get support from other people, to explain why they're having a, a shit day, a shit week, a really horrible month, um, because it's kind of taboo. And I don't think it should be, um, and many people agree with me. So Moody and I thought that this would be a good way to kind of, I don't know, have a conversation about it, um, frame it in um, an historical context to show that this has always happened, unfortunately probably will always happen, um, and that it's it's one of the things that unfortunately makes us human and links us to all of the people who have come before us. Um, so right before I got pregnant with Oliver, I miscarried. Um, Oliver is our one-year-old, for those of you who have not met him. He is huge and loud and adorable. Um, but uh, it was my first pregnancy and I uh, had something, I think they call it a blighted ovum, which basically means that the egg was never truly fertilized, but my body still thought it was pregnant. So um, I had positive pregnancy tests. The doctor told me I was pregnant. Um, we arranged for my first scan, uh, which was really, really exciting. And um, I told my family and got really just excited because we'd been trying to be pregnant and and we were gonna have a baby um and then we went for the first scan which is i think 12 weeks um and they put the um the ultrasound thing on my stomach and there was nothing um and i started to get kind of worried the um the technician kept kind of looking and moving the, the ultrasound around and trying to find something in there and she went very quiet and left the room to get a doctor. And it was at that point I thought, oh, this isn't normal. There is a problem here. Um, and the doctor came back and said, I'm, I'm very sorry, but um, something's gone wrong. Um, you're not actually pregnant. And uh, so I went to my, my obstetrician and and decided that I didn't particularly want to have an operation uh, to like a to aid clearing out my uterus. I wanted to just like, wait for my body to do it by itself, mainly because I'm paranoid and terrified of things like general anesthetics. Um, hospitals aren't great places to be. I didn't really want to go in if I didn't have to. So I waited and waited and it was like four or five weeks and nothing happened. So I, I had to go back in anyway um, and have the dreaded general anesthetic and, and have the doctors um, 
take out um, all of the tissue inside my body that had been preparing for a baby that wasn't actually there. Um, oh, look, it's Oliver. <laughs> I just thought you might want to hold him more. Oh, you thank you. I appreciate it. Oh, it's Oliver. I'll take it back. <laughs> thank you. Um, so it was it was physically uncomfortable and, and not fun, but emotionally it was it was really rough because even though technically I wasn't actually pregnant and hadn't been pregnant, um, the egg was never properly fertilized. There wasn't an embryo growing inside me. It, in my mind, I was pregnant and it was exciting and there was a baby and then suddenly there wasn't. Um, so that was rough. And um, I feel I was very lucky because I would told people, even though it was before when you're traditionally supposed to tell friends and family, because I told people I had a lot of support. I could call my mum and say, I'm miscarrying. And I could call my best friend and say, this is horrible and she could support me and be there for me and i wouldn't have had that if if i hadn't said anything and a lot of women don't say anything because it's not something you talk about ever um and you don't tell people you're pregnant until uh, the end of the first trimester because you might miscarry and then because you have to tell people that you've miscarried um but i find it it was good to have that support bye bye Bye. That was Oliver. <laughs> so it it turned out okay because I, I have a, a giant shouty baby, but um, it's really rough and it's horrible if you don't talk to people about it. So talk to people, get support. Sorry, that was really long and rambling. Long and rambling is good, especially with something so painful. I'm sorry you went through that. And I think long and rambling is also good because it kind of gives a segue to me for me to be long and rambling about my own miscarriage. Go for um, it. I completely agree. I think it's such a taboo subject and no one talks about it, partly because it's devastating when it happens and no one wants to sort of share that kind of news. Um, with people who are not close to them. Um, and I think it's sort of exacerbated by these social media personas that we try to, um, uh, yes, sh share with the world these very highly curated experiences of our lives. So as far as many people who do miscarry know, not a single one of their friends has miscarried because people only share the healthy babies at the end. They don't share the process that got to that, even though at least in the UK, around one in four uh, pregnancies and in miscarriage. So in my own case, I had a similar experience because uh, rather than miscarrying naturally at home, which I thought was the only way that it could happen, because <laughs> nobody talks about it, <laughs> I had what's called a missed miscarriage, which is that um, there was a fertilized egg, uh, there was a heartbeat at six weeks at our first scan, and then we went back in for our second scan at eight or nine weeks, they didn't really know uh, the, the, how to date the pregnancy yet. And there was no heartbeat. And I didn't even know that could happen. Uh, and I'm like a fairly well-educated uh, worldly person. Um, and I have tons of friends with, with children and I had just never heard of this before. Uh, so the shock as well as the devastation of learning that the fetus had died inside me and my body didn't detect that was beyond anything I could have ever described. Um, and it really made me think, you know, I, I wasn't ready to sort of share it at the time and I still haven't sort of like advertised it, so to speak. And um, and I think that part of the reason for that is I feel I would feel kind of bad doing that because no one else has. So I think it's important to have these kinds of conversations because it is you lose a kind of future when you when you lose a pregnancy, even if it is imagined, uh, even if it is uh, very hopeful, you know, rather than. Um, uh, tallying up with what's actually happening so far in your life. So um, it's something that's that's incredibly hard for people to go through alone. And I agree with Megan. I think it's something we should talk about. And it is certainly something that has happened for a very long time. And our oldest medical texts uh, address miscarriage in a lot of detail, as well as a host of other um, reproductive health issues and health issues that are unique to women. Um, and I look forward to, to sharing those to give us all a bit of perspective on our connection with the past and how old these issues really are. Thank you for sharing that. And I'm I'm incredibly sorry that that's, that's devastating. It's awful. Um, Thank you. But um, so having brought everyone down,
<laughs> I'm not going to apologize because I really think this is important to talk about. Uh, let's get into the historical sources. Um, so I sent uh, Moody a, a selection of questions beforehand so she could have a chance to prepare. So I'm going to start working my way through them. If we get um, into tangents and sides, questions, and that's totally fine. That's what this is all about. Um, so uh, just very generally, what sources are there for like, women's health and miscarriage in, in the ancient Near East? Quite a lot, actually. So I'm going to give like a two second crash course in medicine in Mesopotamia, uh, because I think uh, when I tell people I study medical texts, they look at me like there can't possibly be any medical texts. You must have like maybe one or two sources. But in reality, there are thousands of medical texts, most of them from the first millennium BC. So from about 900 to 300 BC, something like that. Um, but there are older ones. The oldest one is from 2400 BC, and it gives a list of her herbal remedies for a variety of different ailments from Ebla. Um, and, and typically modern scholars divide them into two basic categories. One is diagnostic texts, so texts that list symptoms and give diagnoses and prognoses. And then we have a very rich and diverse corpus of therapeutic texts. And these are ones that also give symptoms and sometimes diagnoses, though not every cluster of symptoms is assigned a label, um, and very detailed treatments that combine magical um, remedies, uh, so incantations, various complicated rituals, um, with medical, well, we would call them medical remedies, although in the ancient world, the whole thing would have been considered medical. Um, and by that, we mean uh, herbs, uh, salves, lotions, and uh, other kind of things that you can drink, usually mixed in with beer, um, to assist with your symptoms or to, to cure them. Um, so that's those are the kinds of uh, sources we have for the study of medicine in general. And as a subset of these therapeutic texts, we have very, very many gynecological texts, that is texts that deal specifically with women's health. Um, and these, again, fit with the general um, gist of medical texts. So we have really elaborate incantations for childbirth, for example, alongside really elaborate um, rituals and herbal remedies for perhaps bleeding in the middle of a pregnancy, which would be something that's uh, con that would was considered at the time and known to be uh, not not ideal, uh, not not normal pregnancy. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so that's a the rough sketch of the medical sources. But we also have hints in other sources. We have um, re references in literary texts to sexual sexuality, sexual acts, um, and uh, it, you know indirectly those give us information about the female body and understandings of it. And then letters give us information. Uh, quite rarely, but still uh, happens, about illness. Um, and there's one that we're going to read uh, from a woman who had a mis missed miscarriage um, uh, that we think. It, there are um, may potentially different ways to translate it. Um, and legal texts as well. Uh, and I, by that, I mean uh, law collections rather than everyday legal documents like contracts. Um, they do furnish some information about how um, health issues uh, relating to women might have been addressed in a kind of legal context. So that's a really rough sketch. There are, there are others, of course, but those are the basic uh, categories. Fantastic. There's actually like a lot of stuff because one of the one of the problems that you often hear with studying women in history is there just there aren't enough sources. Mm -hmm. uh, it sounds like there's actually an awful lot of, excuse me, a lot of information on this that we can use. Absolutely, yes. And I think that's, um, uh, yes, there, there are more medical texts that deal with men, but it's not actually men. It, that's just the sign used to, to refer to the person, uh, kind of the way we use the word guy uh, nowadays, like, oh, you guys can, ref I'm, I don't agree with it, but it can refer to more than one gender. Um, uh, and, and, I, and I think you're absolutely right. I think it's, it's maybe more the case that scholars have been until the last few decades, less interested in these sources or less aware of, of, of their importance. Um, rather than the, the sources aren't there, don't worry. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and the problem with being so high up, everything is, is down. So if I drop things, it makes a really loud clanging sound. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry. I'm 100% sure a dog will bark at some point during this episode. So <laughs> there are no noises abound. <laughs> And there'll probably be another screaming baby at some point. Um, so um, these medical texts that you're you're telling us about, um, 
do they uh, separate, like are there texts that deal only with women and texts that deal only with men or do they tend to be more combined? Both. So for sort of general ailments, uh, they're combined and that by that I mean sort of fevers, headaches, um, ep uh, seizures that may or may not be epilepsy, um, ge general kind of health issues that are not uh, dependent on a person's sex or gender. Um, and, but there are also um, series of texts that deal with um, gender specific uh, issues. So there is a series of um, uh, incantation texts called, uh, well, it doesn't matter what they're called in, in Akkadian, but they deal with uh, male sexual dysfunction, and they're mainly addressed to the goddess Ishtar, which makes sense because she was the goddess of uh, love, sex, and uh, fertility, as well as war. I think it's been written about her that she enjoyed love making as much as battle making <laughs> as a goddess. Um, and then, uh, of course, we have a uh, many gynecological texts in which the subject is a woman patient. Okay. Um, so it's specific to that. Mm -hmm. So um, can I did and I didn't write this question down earlier. So if it's a little bit out of left field, say and we'll move on. Um, but how easy is it? And I asked you something similar last time. How easy is it to look at these ancient texts and map on what we like know of modern medical ailments? Mm. I think um, I think I, I, without sounding kind of um, judgmental, I think that's a kind of uh, lazy approach in the sense that it's it's kind of easy to find what you want in the in the material, and often what we want is to match up the ancient material to modern uh, diagnoses. But if you think about it, the types of information that was recorded and the way they're organized. Would, is just not going to match up to the types of information we would expect when making a modern diagnosis or a diagnosis in modern medical models. Um, in addition, medicine and illness, so health and illness, are in, in many ways statistical uh, in the sense that they're reliant on social norms about what is considered normal and abnormal. So for example, uh, in ancient Mesopotamia, hearing voices was not necessarily a sign of any kind of um, mental disorder. It might have just been some way, a way of communicating with forces that they recognize to be quite real that we no longer do in most uh, medical traditions. Um, so I think that's kind of a good example of how dependent uh, medicine and, and medical traditions are on the social milieu. So I think that's not necessarily the most helpful approach. Um, it, it risks obscuring what's actually in the text in favor of what we want there to be in the text. Um, but at the same time with the gynecological texts, um, there are some pretty clear, even if we don't know the underlying causes that were at work, descriptions that can match up to experiences that we do recognize as um, uh, experiences that require medical attention in today's uh, world. Um, but they again don't differentiate between them in the same way. So just to give a very quick example, um, blood is referenced in, uh, I mean, it's it's kind of the main symptom uh, category that you have in a lot of these gynecological texts, but there's no differ differentiation in terminology for uh, blood that's menstruation, blood that follows childbirth. It, it has to be kind of figured out from context or, or even some, uh, another, you know, hemorrhage of some description that's not related to either of those two things. So, um, so I, I think it's, it, it's more interesting and does the text more justice to just read what they say and try to work out how they organized and made sense of these medical experiences. Excellent, thank you. Um, so could you give us um, some examples of like problems and suggested treatments that we see? Yeah, absolutely. I made a little handy list because it's a lot actually <laughs> to remember. Um, so I'll just read a few of these, but um, we there were uh, treatments to help with conception. Uh, so I guess the kind of really rudimentary IVF if you wanted to uh, try to compare it to anything modern, um, uh, as well as uh, ways of dealing with um, abortion. So uh, in all of these texts, I think one thing that does stand out is that the patient is the woman. Um, so if there was any risk to her life involving pregnancy, for example, she was the priority. Uh, so there were methods of aborting um, 
a fetus. And I think uh, uh, a mis miscarriage is actually a good example because it did happen and we have, and there are uh, descriptions of it. Um, and it, there would have been ways for them to detect that, for example, a lack of physical growth uh, in the woman, um, in the pregnant woman. Um, but a, an untreated mis miscarriage can lead to sepsis that would kill um, mm -hmm. the expectant mother. So, uh, so they had to come up with ways to uh, deal with that situation as well. Um, a lot of uh, treatments are geared to stop bleeding, uh, and that, again, is all sorts of bleeding, whether it's um, excessive period blood or um, postpartum um, discharges, um, bleeding during pregnancy, preventing miscarriage, um, a premature birth, difficult childbirth. There's a wonderful incantation that I'll, I'll read to you guys in a second. Uh, you guys, see, I just use guys. You all. <laughs> <laughs> it's ingrained. <laughs> um, um, uh, relief of pain uh, after childbirth, prolapse of the uterus and rectum, um, other kinds of discharges. Uh, so fevers, which uh, would have um, might have been specific to uh, specific uh, to gynecological problems, um, u uterine uh, and u urological problems, which weren't always uh, uh, differentiated in a way that's clear to us, um, and other other kind of um, belly complaints, let's say like gastrointestinal gastrointestinal issues um, and and rectal issues. So uh, lots and lots of uh, detail and lots and lots of uh, issues were addressed in these in these texts. Fantastic, thank you. Um, so, um, do we know anything or anything specific about the the people who would have been treating gynecological issues? Were they men? Were they women? Did it just not matter? Um, that is a really good question. <laughs> so I, um, I have been meaning to uh, double check this because it is very interesting, but um, I know there are references to uh, women physicians, but I've only read that in English. So I don't know <laughs> when they say physician, do they mean, um, there, were, there were at least three kinds of medical professionals operating in ancient Mesopotamia. One is the, in, in Akkadian, the Ashipu, which is often, problematically, but it's the best we can do, translated as exorcist. And that's the one that deals with the kind of magical side of, of treatment, uh, identifying the underlying supernatural cause and figuring out which incantation or ritual to use to treat that. And then there's something, someone called the Asu, who is uh, translated as physician, who deals with the more herbal uh, uh, side of things, the, the materia medica, as it's called. Um, and then the Baru, which is like a diviner who reads signs either on the body or unrelated to the body to try to determine the course of illness. Um, and so I don't know when these um, secondary sources refer to female physicians, which one they're talking about, or if they're talking about a midwife, which we do have evidence for. Um, and the word for midwife actually I, is um, Shabshutum, which comes, which is lovely because it comes, it's a loan from Sumerian. Um, and the Sumerian uh, compound word was Shabzu. The word sha means inside, um, or sort of, it can mean heart, but it means inside of the body more generally. And zu means to know. So it's someone that knows the inside of the body, which I think is really lovely. That's really cool. <laughs> Isn't it? Um, and the, the more full term for that is shabshut reimim, so midwife of the womb. So the, the, the word for womb is reim, reimum or reimu in later periods, um, which Incidentally, it's the same word for mercy. Um, and also, just another connection, because I'm on a tangent, um, the, one of the gods associated with childbirth, the kind of patron god of childbirth, was Marduk, which is kind of surprising. That is, I didn't know that. That, that is surprising. And it's because of his association with mercy, because he has this dual nature of being cruel and merciful, which you see in the beginning of Ludlow Bill Namiki, the kind of uh, paradigmatic sufferer. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, uh, and it's his merciful nature that's called upon in um, difficult childbirths. That's really interesting. I love what you can, like the little bits of information you can glean from just individual words and how they're used and where they come from. Yeah, absolutely. And it, and it operates even in, in even more depth uh, when you start to work, uh, look at metaphors in medical texts and how those metaphors come into play literally in rituals. So uh, the woman's body, for example, is often uh, metaphorically described as a vessel, um, which kind of makes sense. It's a vessel that kind of carries a baby um, at some point or, or other. Um, 
in in uh, in some conceptions of of the female body in these medical texts um and some of these rituals incorporate vessels for example in them um the 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 kind of passage of of a fetus in childbirth into the world is sometimes conceptualized as a boat moving down a river so in a difficult childbirth the river or the canal is stopped up and the river plays an important role in some of these medical rituals i mean it does in general as well so it's just interesting to see it, you know talking about terminology and the double meaning of words as well as the double usage of of metaphors both metaphorically or figuratively and literally so that's really rich cool. corpus. <laughs> <laughs> so we've covered this a very little bit already with the what you were saying about the the river metaphor. But um, how were gynecological and and like fertility issues understood by people in Mesopotamia? I mean, I think there are different ways to answer that. They were they were understood, I would say, in great detail. I mean, if you uh, try to imagine uh, the experience of um, uh, well, the interior goings on, uh, whether it's to do with pregnancy or not, it, it's difficult to understand that in the absence of medical technology. You know, they didn't have scanners, um, they didn't have even anything to listen to a heartbeat or anything like that. So um, it, uh, it was understood with reference to what was going on on the outside. Um, uh, whether that was, uh, you know, symptoms that manifested like fevers or bleeding or um, other forms of discharge, uh, behavioral uh, issues that can come with the physiological changes. Um, so it was understood with reference to those, but it was also understood with, excuse me, reference to metaphors. And I think we talked about this last time, but I'll just um, briefly say again that metaphor serves a really important purpose in scientific language. It's often associated with literature because it plays an important Part of literary language, but metaphor provides a way of describing things that aren't fully understood in a, in a way that highlights certain aspects of those experiences, sometimes at the expense of others. Um, so uh, a sort of rich uh, series of metaphors are used in the gynecological text to help uh, describe and make sense of um, what they must have understood um, sort of fundamentally, but struggled to find, to figure out exactly how to, to word it. Fantastic. Were there, um, so you've, you've said briefly that um, there were considered to be supernatural causes underlying um, many, if not all, medical issues. Were there specific, um, and I know the answer to this, so I'm, this is completely a leading question, um, but are there specific like demons, uh, gods, goddesses responsible for gynecological issues? And, and issues in childbirth. Yes, absolutely. Um, and um, again, to give a two second summary, in, in um, medicine in general, there's kind of this two, two levels of causation that operate. It's not that they thought everything was only caused by supernatural causes. That, that was just one part of the picture. So there's one level, the ultimate level is is the the cause starts in the supernatural world and then there's the secondary level where of a natural cause so like if you get a snake bite for example obviously they knew it was a snake that bit you <laughs> um but why did the snake bite you you know so um so it, it already it operates like that in all um and all, across all uh, medical texts in gynecological texts um there are a few demons uh that are and, and god goddesses responsible for um the health and well-being of women and specifically unborn uh, fetuses or newborn babies. Uh, famously, Lamashtu, uh, who's a demon, who, who interestingly is the only demon for whom, I, I think, for whom we have a genealogy. In other words, she's the only demon that they bothered to explain who she's the daughter of and why she behaves the way she does and why she targets um, unborn babies and newborn babies. And the reason given is that she was kind of robbed of this experience by dying young, um, so um, so she is a demon that's associated with um, issues relating to childbirth. So a lot of incantations are addressed to her, for example. Um, witchcraft is also another leading cause, let's say, of um, um, miscarriage and uh, problems with childbirth, uh, more specifically. Witchcraft is a cause of all sorts of problems, from uh, sexual dysfunction in men to depression to fever. I mean, it, it's, it's a, it's a kind of um, a salient cause, let's say, in the medical literature. Um, but it does play a, an important role in, in the gynecological text as well. So that what that basically means is that, um, just to kind of build on your question, is that the treatments for these various ailments 
unique to women are then addressed to the supernatural causes thought to be responsible for those ailments like Lamashtu or witchcraft. Fantastic, thank you. Um, so I have one more question and then we can just chat about really whatever you feel like chatting about. Um, does it seem like miscarriage was a taboo subject then as it is now or was it, do you get the impression that it was more openly discussed? So that, that's a really good and a really difficult question. Like, I, I wish I could answer it with a bit more certainty. Um, but mm -hmm. I think the problem is the types of sources that would give us information about whether or not something is taboo are not the same sources that give us information about miscarriage. So um, uh, the gynecological texts are technical medical manuals, essentially. They are going to be devoid of judgment. Um, and they're going to be they're going to be straightforward. They're not uh, trying to use euphemisms to describe something they're trying to treat. That's just going to get in the way. Um, so from that perspective, no, it seemed like a medical problem that you could go get treatment for that was seen as a perfectly natural thing that could happen, um, but that needed medical attention. Um, but unfortunately, we don't have enough, I think, sources uh, from everyday documents uh, and specifically ones that share the stories of women to tell us more about whether or not it was taboo. There, There is um, miscarriage referenced in, in legal contexts, which I have pulled out to read to you, if I may, if that's okay. Yes, please, please. So um, at the Middle Assyrian period, um, th there's a, a collection of laws called the Middle Assyrian Laws, it's so great at naming things. I love it. <laughs> exactly. Um, so it's, it was probably from around the middle of the uh, second millennium BC, um, but it's mainly known from later copies. Um, and there is a series of entries in uh, a tablet of these laws that deals exclusively with women. I feel like I worded that weird. There's a tablet of these laws that deals exclusively with women, and there's a series of entries within it that deal with miscarriage brought on by assault. So trigger warning for assault and, and miscarriage if, uh, if you want to tune out. Um, so we have, if a man strikes another man's wife, thereby causing her to abort her fetus, um, and they, uh, that a man's wife, and then something, it's broken, um, they shall treat him as he treated her. He shall make full payment of a life for her fetus. And if that woman dies, they shall kill that man. He shall make full payment of a life for her fetus. And if there is no son of that woman's husband and his wife whom he struck aborted her fetus, in other words, miscarried, not at purpose, <laughs> they shall kill the assailant for her fetus. If her fetus was a female, he shall make full payment of a life only. So this is quite a full uh, entry. It tells us a little bit about um, the value of the life of the fetus, the value of the life of the woman, mm. and a kind of gendered value, um, as well as the fact that they would have been able to tell that from um, a, a, um, a lost fetus. The, um, the entry that follows modifies this for um, uh, a, uh, a different kind of uh, social, social class. So we start with a, a normal kind of wife of an awilum, wife of a man. Um, and then in the next entry, it's uh, dealing with a prostitute, which is uh, not a, at all a judgment of um, of that profession. It's something that get, gets, gets dealt with uh, in legal texts like any other profession. If a man strikes a prostitute, causing her to abort her fetus, they shall assess him blow for blow. He shall make full payment of a life. So there is still value attached, of course, to the life lost or lives lost. Um, there's another entry a little bit earlier um, that also deals with, oh yes, sorry, there's an entry in an earlier law code, um, which is the laws of Hammurabi from a few hundred years before. So that's from around 1750 BC. Um, and that says, um, If a, an awilu, so if a certain kind of social class, strikes a woman of that class and thereby causes her to miscarry her fetus, he shall weigh and deliver 10 shekels of silver for her fetus. So it's a different, it's a much different punishment here. It's a monetary one. It's not a life for a life. Uh, so, mm -hmm. to so these, this is just to illustrate that um, there were different ways of framing 
um, the problem that may give us some idea of the, not necessarily the stigma, but the value um, attached to pregnancy and therefore to lost uh, pregnancy in a legal system. The problem, of course, is that we don't know whether or not the laws that are detailed in these were applied. Um, they might have just been scholarly texts that, um, or propagandistic texts that were um, that served some other function, or that weren't at least uh, required to be to be applied. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's just to know that we have a few other sources that may give hints, but they're again not quite the right kinds of sources. Um, I did copy down a um, a letter that we were that was referenced on Twitter. Yes, and I'd love to hear that one. Um, I just have to find it in my extremely not organized notes, which is kind of a great metaphor for my brain. <laughs> While you're looking, everyone, if you have questions, please put them in the side chat, um, tag me in them. I am keeping half an eye out on it, and if I miss something, then Josh will uh, Josh will let me know. Um, but yeah, put your questions in the side chat, um, and in maybe 10 minutes, we'll start going through those. Here we go. Um, okay, so it's an old Babylonian letter, which means it's from somewhere between 2000 and 1600 BC. And it's a letter from a, a, a female slave, uh, a slave girl as it's, as it's written, whose name is Dabitum. And this is interesting because it's, she discusses something very openly with her, her lord, it's, we don't exactly know, I, I imagine it's the person she works for, um, that we wouldn't have maybe imagined. So the letter reads, tell my master, your slave girl Dabitum sends the following message. What I have told you now has happened to me. For seven months, this unborn child was in my body, but for a month now, the child has been dead and nobody takes care of me. If this is the mood of my lord, then let me not die. <clears throat> Look after me and let me see the face of my Lord. But if I have to die, let me see the face of my Lord, and then I may die. So it's it's, tra it's a heartbreaking letter in which a woman is talking about a stillbirth, um, which, um, you know, there must have been some pretty obvious ways to, to detect after a certain period of time elapsed. Um, and, uh, and she's discussing it quite openly and saying, you know, that no one's looking after me. This horrible thing has happened that is potentially life-threatening and I might die, you know, and I, I at least want to see you um, and, and address this before that happens. Uh, so that that is a very kind of rare, I think. Uh, um, there, might, there may be other sources uh, that are obviously unpublished or that I'm not aware of that are similar, that uh, similarly um, every day in the sense of a letter rather than a legal document or a mm -hmm. medical text. Um, but I think something like that would be much more helpful in assessing the question of taboo uh, with miscarriage. Um, but unfortunately, we just don't have enough <laughs> to answer that question. That's, that's, um, that's quite a fantastic letter, though, yeah. to have that from so long ago. Absolutely. And there, there are different, um, the word that's translated as unborn child is, um, it's, there's a little bit of interpretation added, but I think it actually makes sense. It's, it, the, I think the word is shiru, which is flesh. Um, and uh, given the time frame reference, the seven months and the you know, potential death, I think it makes sense to, to read it that way. But it is quite an extraordinary window onto one woman's experience from 3,000 years ago. Yeah. Wow. Well, thank you. Um, was there anything else that you wanted to share with us, or shall we switch to questions? Um, maybe we can switch to, to questions for a bit. I'd love okay. to hear what you have to ask. So, um, LT Galloway says, is it true that doctors and diviners would err on the pessimistic side because they would be punished for a bad diagnosis? Hmm, interesting. Um, I, I don't know. Uh, that's a good question. I think uh, questions tend to be pretty good, and I almost uh, never can answer them. Yeah, no, I, and I, uh, what I love about questions is they make you think about things in uh, ways that you don't think about because you're so tied to what the sources say. <laughs> you never yeah. actually look beyond that. Um, so I'll try to answer that as best I can. I think there have been different theories about um, the diagnostic texts, and, uh, and I'm answering with reference to these because I think this is a possible good approach. Um, the diagnostic texts are a little weird. They, they read, for example, they'll, they'll have um, a set of symptoms. Like if a man is suffering from fever and he has a headache, the diagnosis is hand of Ishtar, he will die. 
And then in the next entry, it'll be something like, if a man is suffering from a headache and he has no fever, the diagnosis is still hand of Ishtar, but he will not die. So it's kind of odd. Like the 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 way the terminology of these diagnostic texts is a little bit difficult to come to grips with, and and also to try to work out how it was used. We know for sure it was used because we have excerpts of these texts in letters, for example, from physicians to the Neo-Assyrian kings. Um, and what some have surmised is that. Um, the diagnostic text served as a kind of um, thing to measure reality against. Or um, if if a um, if a physician wanted to kind of protect himself, he could say, "Well, I was just going with what the diagnostic text said. Um, so if things didn't turn out that way, it's not exactly my fault. It's you know mm -hmm. something else happened that we missed." Um, so that's a that's a great question. We we also have records of physicians sort of falling out of favor with kings. Um, and, uh, and there's a letter that I love to cite, it's one of my favorite letters, uh, from Nahu Tabni Utsur, in which he's complaining about not being paid, essentially, and uh, and his, uh, his heart is breaking and he's crying <laughs> stress, basically, which I think... Uh, <laughs> I'm going to mute this because he's going to keep making noise for a while. <laughs> Um, so, um, so we do, you know, there, there were physicians that fell out of favor, but, um, I, not, this doesn't mean it didn't happen, but I'm not aware of sort of severe punishments for, um, getting a diagnosis and prognosis, uh, wrong. Thank you. Um, so, and I, if someone's asked, um, is there any online resource where they can read the text that you're talking about? Um, yes, um, there, so there is. Uh, I mean, this isn't exactly an online resource, but there's a Google Books preview of um, this book, which I will, I always have almost with me. Um, source book for Mesopotamia or ancient ancient Mesopotamian medicine by Joanne Skurlock. Um and there is a chapter in that on gynecological texts. And uh, the Google Books preview is actually pretty good, so um, I imagine there may be a PDF floating around online that I'm not aware of. <laughs> Um, there's also in the original text, so it's not as helpful, but there is a database of medical texts called, um, on, on a website for BabMed, Babylonian Medicine, um, at the Free University of Berlin. Um, and I, I, those are the only two I can think of right now that are purely open access resources. But what I will do is I'll, I'll double check and I'll share it on my Twitter because I, I do think I love op sharing open access stuff. I love open access. And um, it would be great for people to be able to read the original sources as um, uh, as much as it's nice to hear kind of secondary analysis. Or maybe it's not nice. I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Um, so Steve Bowden is asking, do the medical texts we have found reveal any ideas regarding women's rights at the time? Um, I, I think uh, the best way, not necessarily, I think um, um, we have other texts that give us insights into women's rights um, and legal texts are a really, really good resource for that, especially in the later periods. And by legal texts, I don't just mean these law collections that I was reading excerpts from. I mean, contracts, marriage documents, divorce documents, um, the, those sorts of everyday records. Um, and, uh, and, and actually, for um, for certain periods, we have records of women conducting business just like men and um, living separately uh, from sort of the male household. Uh, so we, we can reconstruct uh, ideas about women's rights from those materials, less so I'd say from the medical materials. But I will reiterate a point I made before, which is that we do get a sense that the priority is the woman, uh, the woman's life in, from the medical texts, and that um, while um, they do what they can to uh, save a fetus when things have gone wrong, they do more than that to save uh, the life of the woman. Thank you very much. Um, so a vegan atheist is saying, uh, are the texts related to medicine more like uh, recipes or science books? Ooh, both. Um, so I think um, science is, is um, I think it's important to recognize that these works belong to the early history of science, because science really, when you think about it, is um, 
the the task of rendering the world comprehensible in some way uh, with reference to kind of uh, consistent methods of looking at that world and trying to understand it. Um, so certainly they they are science uh, textbooks in that sense that they they fit with this um, overarching attempt by scholars in Mesopotamia and, and others to make sense of the experiences that people have, uh, the medical experiences, as well as the the world around them. So astronomical texts is, is a great example of those. Um, but they are also recipes um, and, and they are instruction texts. So they give step-by-step um, -step information about how to perform a specific ritual, um, how to mix and prepare specific ingredients to be uh, consumed or rubbed on the body in, in some wherever the wound might be um, in, uh, in order to treat illness. So it's a bit of both really. I think um, it's, it's, uh, it's important not to try to make the structure or content of these texts match up to modern science in evaluating their scienciness not a word, but you <laughs> get it. Um, um, but, um, but at the same time, read what's actually in them um, and, and um, try to bring the, those aspects of medicine to light. Fantastic, thank you. And this um, this kind of leads on a little bit. Um, alias fate name, has anyone tried to recreate oh, any yeah. of the herbal remedies that we have written from the time? Um, people have tried to recreate other recipes. So I remember when I first started in Assyriology, someone tried to make Sumerian beer and it was apparently undrinkable. Um, but in terms of the herbal remedies, it's a bit more difficult because we can't translate what all of the herbs are. Um, and often we have to leave things in the original Akkadian, even though we know they're herbs because of the way they're written. Um, in, in the cuneiform writing system, there is a, a type of sign that's called a determinative that comes in front of of a word and that basically tells you the type of object being referred to. So for example, deities names will be preceded by the divine determinative, which looks like a star, which is also a cuneiform sign that can be read in different ways. Um, types of wood are preceded by the um, Sumerian logogram um, Gish, uh, words, I'm pronouncing it wrong, but uh, uh, to, to, sh to show that the thing that comes after is a type of wood. So similarly in these medical texts, you have herbs preceded by a sign, U, which is uh, the sign for herbs or plants. Um, and then stones or minerals that are used are preceded by the sign that indicates um, that the thing referred to as a stone or a mineral. So we know what they are, we just don't know what they are. <laughs> um, so which makes it difficult to reconstruct the recipes. Wonderful, thank you. Um, this is an interesting one, and I genuinely don't know the answer. Um, Annette MD uh, says that she's a, an obstetrician gynecologist. Did the Mesopotamians consider menstruation as something abnormal, like the Abrahamic religions? For example, was it something that women needed to atone for? Hmm. That's a great question, um, and I think the problem is that uh, again we're 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 stuck with what the sources give us, and the medical texts only tell us about when things have gone wrong. So we we can reconstruct certain aspects of normal. Uh, um, women's health from that indirectly, but but not direct. We don't have direct statements of it. So um, we do have records of abnormal menstruation um, as something that required attention. So excessive bleeding that won't stop or a period that has just not showed up for too long, uh, but in the absence of a pregnancy. Um, and uh, so from, from those texts, again, we don't get a kind of um, ideas about purity or impurity or anything like that coming through. Um, there is an old Babylonian reference, I can't remember what, I think it's an administrative text that says that women uh, in the palace of Mari have to leave for a certain number of days a month. And on the basis of this one sentence, an entire kind of like uh, a theory about menstruation and impurity has been constructed that scholars are slowly starting to kind of tear down because it, it reads a little bit too much into the ancient sources based on what we want them to say based on slightly later sources, but also based on some modern ideas um, that would have biased early Assyriologists as well. So this is this is an excellent question. And I think um, there's, there's a great article that's coming out by uh, a scholar who's 
specialty is these texts um, named Ulrika Steinert, who I'm pretty sure I referred to in my last <laughs> interview as well because I'm obsessed with her work, um, that discusses uh, women's blood in general uh, from a variety of perspectives, including menstruation. So um, when when that uh, comes out, I'll definitely share it because uh, it's I've, I've had the chance to read it and it's brilliant, uh, but I just one can't second. share it within it yet. I'll just add that um, all the sources that Moody shares on her Twitter, I will try and remember to put in the description to this video. So if you're watching it later um, and you want to follow up some of this look in the description there should be links to the things that we've referenced um uh vegan atheist again uh were these texts passed on in uh like family groups or apprenticeships um it was more like apprenticeships in the sense that it was um they were copied down in a kind of scholarly milieu which uh was uh, um, done according to a set of rules uh, that governed that uh, that class of, of people. Um, uh, in the later periods, this changes a little bit. It becomes more like scholarly families. Um, but uh, in general, they were copied by men, <laughs> um, by male scholars. So that's another potential problem with uh, what we can reconstruct uh, from the sources, another limitation, not, not necessarily a problem, of uh, what we can reconstruct. And uh, and it's interesting because um, the, the Hippocratic Oath, uh, this is, which is later, but the Hippocratic Oath was actually an oath of secrecy originally. And we have a similar oath obtaining in the colophon, so in the signature sections of these tablets, saying this is secret knowledge not to be shared with the uninitiated, essentially. And it's secret knowledge of the scholars, secret knowledge of the gods, of the universe. It's it's just other ways of showing that this belongs to a certain group of people um, and in the wrong hands might do wrong. So uh, so it was protected, uh, a kind of protected uh, class of people, not, sorry, they weren't protected legally or anything like that, but the, the knowledge they produce was protected and, and stayed within those who were trained in, in scribal scholarship and in scholarship more generally. Wonderful, thank you. Um, we have, let's see, um, lots of people saying thank you for answering questions and for enjoying like uh, what you're saying. Um, oh yes, uh, were, I can't find the question now, but were um, malformed babies considered also to be the result of, of gods and demons? Hmm. Um, I don't know enough about that to answer it. I think um, they appear, they're described more in omen texts. There's a, a series of omens about um, deformities just more generally. Um, but um, again, it, rather than telling us the causes of uh, such um, uh, of the things getting described, it's more just describing them and then giving some completely unrelated outcome, which is the structure of most omen texts. So for example, I'm most familiar with the astronomical ones. If, if an eclipse occurs in this part of the sky on this day, then Elam will fall, that sort of thing. So it's not like where they're not really related to each other um, in, in the way we understand them um, uh, or immediately to, to, the, to the eye, though they have ways of relating to each other <laughs> that become obvious with more study. But um, so that's a long way around saying I don't know, <laughs> um, but they are described. So it's a good question. I don't know is always an acceptable answer. I tell them all the time. I don't know. I don't know. I'm really sorry. I don't know. Um, <laughs> David Friskin says, question, thanks to Moody. And can she come back again? I would love to. If you'll have me, it's my pleasure. <laughs> I would definitely have you back again. Um, Jared Trigo, do we have ancient medical texts from other ancient peoples besides these and um, the Egyptians, Greeks, Chinese, and Romans? For example, do we have anything from the Hittites and the Canaanites? I don't know, actually. Um, I don't know. I'm sort of embarrassingly not knowledgeable about the Hittites, even though it was at the same time and neighboring. Um, I, one, one thing I randomly do know is that uh, there was one physician from Babylon that uh, went to the Hittite court, and we know about his whole life from a series of letters and administrative texts, which is super cool. Um, his name was Rabba Shah Marduk, if anybody wants to Google him. Um, but um, but I, don't, I don't actually know. That's a really, that's a good question. Um, I wish I did know. No, it is a good question, and I also absolutely no idea. Um, vegan atheist, uh, were there schools like medical school, or was it more like on the job training? Um, I we so we we don't I don't think we know that there were medical schools, but we know a lot about um, <clears throat> the scribal curriculum in general, and that the the people that were trained in these specialisms, whether it was writing contracts out or doing like field calculations or uh, uh, making astronomical observations and in later periods, astronomical calculations. So we know that these were kind of specialisms that people went on to do after the basic um, 
a scribal curriculum. Um, and I imagine medicine was done in much the same way uh, that the other training was was done. I, I just don't know exactly how it was done. I, I, I don't think though that it was sort of like a, a university setting or even a small one. Um, I think it would have been more, um, a bit smaller and tighter knit, tight, more tightly knit than that. But that's a really another really good question. Mm -hmm. it's that kind of thing scribal training and medical training is always really interesting to try and understand how it happened and where it happened and who was allowed to do it and all kinds of interesting stuff yeah there's a great book by if, if you if you uh, which i haven't read in, in since it came out um almost 10 years ago now um by mark geller who's brilliant uh called uh, i think it's ancient babylonian medicine theory and practice or something along those lines there's definitely a free pdf online that's totally legally uh available <laughs> we like legally available free pdfs <laughs> I think it's on archive or however you say that dot org. And um, he may address that in one of the early chapters of the book if you wanted to have a look there. Lovely. Thank you. Um, Pinball 1970. Uh, what gods and goddesses were they worshipping at the time? And they also wanted to know the language of the letter that you read. The language of the letter was Akkadian, and it was the old Babylonian dialect of Akkadian, which happens to also to be my favorite dialect of Akkadian. Um, and uh, and Akkadian is my favorite too. Yes, it's everyone's favorite because it's the easiest. <laughs> um, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, so, so Akkadian, uh, just to give a very mini crash course, is the earliest known Semitic language, and it's also uh, an East Semitic language, un unlike sort of Arabic and Hebrew, which are West Semitic languages. Um, and this is also, incidentally, the language of all the medical texts I've been talking about, although the early earliest known medical text is in an um, ablite, which is a dialect. Well, actually, it might be its own language. I don't. I think it's still um, being. Uh, D decided um, how to categorize it. And um, and then we also have a few Sumerian medical texts from around 2100 BC, the Ur-3 period. But the vast majority of the scholarly texts um, that we've been talking about are in Akkadian. Um, and I, now I can't remember the other <laughs> question. <laughs> um, it was about the, the gods that were being worshipped at this time. Oh, yes. Okay. Um, so the Mesopotamian pantheon is kind of, it's uh, it's been laughingly and lovingly called the Mesopotamian pandemonium because it is very confusing. Um, gods and goddesses uh, fall out of worship, uh, get syncretized or mixed with other gods and goddesses. Their iconography can be difficult to reconstruct. So um, it, it depends on the period. The, so for the first millennium and the place as well, because Assyria and Babylonia had different kind of patron uh, gods that they um, prioritized in their pantheons or pantheon, uh, whatever the plural of that is. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, a, a great resource if you want to have like a, um, a quick overview that's easy to read and has um, some lovely images is um, ORAC, O-R-A-C-C. -C. Um, they have a, a list of gods and goddesses from Mesopotamia, and that should give you a really nice idea of um, what what types of gods and goddesses were worshipped where and when and for what there was a healing goddess uh, called gula whose attribute animal was the dog and if i may show my dog uh, <laughs> she's so cute um uh and and she was appealed to in uh, in different medical contexts as well as having a whole um a series of texts built around her Fantastic. Thank you. Um, so we have two more questions and then I think we'll probably wrap it up. If you have any really important questions, get them in now. Um, otherwise, you may have to save them for next time. We've got um, two that I'm kind of going to wrap into this uh, into the same question. Um, so did they have any concept of STDs um, and that were there like recipes for preventing them? Um, and also uh, someone's asking about how genital lice were addressed. Ooh, I don't know about genital lice, um, but I do know that they did uh, treat and describe uh, what may have been STDs. So, um, and and we kind of understand this through, of course, the symptoms, because that's the lowest common denominator that we can match up to modern uh, conceptions about STDs. But one of the uh, feature or symptoms that does get described both for women and men is uh, unusual discharge, um, which may have been a sign of, of STDs, um, as well as being accompanied by other symptoms like fevers, for example. Um, so I would say yes, um, they did. They did. Uh, we, but again, we can't match them up to modern ones. We can just look at symptoms as symptoms. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, like, I think we have 
two more. Um, what kinds of contraception were known at the time? Um, I don't know. I don't know enough about it. They, they did have uh, methods uh, of contraception as well as methods to increase or uh, deal with fertility. Um, but but I don't know. I, that's a really good question. No. Nope. Excellent. I don't know is always acceptable. Um, and finally, uh, Casey Atheist wants to know if you took part in an IQ squared debate on holy texts. What's that? I, don't know I do not know. But if you don't know, the answer is probably no. Okay. Yes, probably not. <laughs> I don't think I've ever done anything to do with anything with IQs before. I don't know if that's really right. <laughs> <laughs> obvious if anyone knew me in real life. <laughs> Well, everybody, thank you for joining us. Before we go, a couple of quick housekeeping announcements. Uh, first, we're really, really close to having 6,000 subscribers. So if you're watching us and you're not subscribed and you would like to be, um, I highly recommend you do that because then we get to 6,000 and you guys get a special live stream. I don't know what we're doing. We were talking about doing like a call-in show where we get people on to ask us questions. Um, but I need to work out the logistics of that. So if you're not subscribed, go and subscribe. Um, if you're watching and you've enjoyed the live stream, please hit the like button. Um, it really helps us um, get our content out there. Um, and just thank you to Moody. It's always a delight to talk to you. Um, and if you are on Twitter uh, audience and you want someone interesting to follow, highly recommend following Moody because she is interesting, informative, and very amusing. Also, you get to see pictures of her dogs, um, which is the highlight of my day. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me, as always. It's always such a pleasure to talk to you. I really appreciate being able to, to do this. Oh, well, it has been wonderful. So, everybody, thank you for joining us, uh, and we will see you again soon.